I hope you heard to me. Thank you very much, Maripaz. Uh, as you can see here, I am Jose Caballero of the Center of Astrobiology, Center of Astrobiology, and I'm going to talk about exoplanet biomarkers. Biomarkers, synonymous of biomarker are biological marker, biosignature, biomolecule, but let's see which are the biomarkers I'm not, I am not to talk about. I am not going to talk about biomarkers in biomedical research, cell biomarkers, genomic, transcriptomic, proteomic, metabolic, molecular, cellular, imaging biomarkers, embryonic biomarkers, cancer biomarkers, and even there is a journal uh, with, the, with the name biomarker. This is very funny. Petroleum biomarkers are highly important in petroleum inspection as they help indicate the, the position of territories and determine the geologi geological properties of oils. Okay, that's very important, but these are not the biomarkers that we are aiming at. Biosignature or biomarker is any substance such as an element, isotope or molecule or phenomenon that provides scientific evidence of past of, or present life. This is what Wikipedia say, uh, says, and we can leave, uh, look for those, those biomarkers outside yeah. the Earth. Biomarkers in the, owners, in the inner solar system. This is what I am not going to talk about either. And this is an example of biomarkers in the inner solar system is the Allen Hills 84001, the Martian meteorite in which a group of scientists found evidence of microscopic fossils of bacteria in 1996 and caused enormous scientific and, and public attention. Chemical analysis guessed that it originated on Mars when there was liquid water on the planet's surface. However, eventually the hypothetical biogenic features, these bacteria structure resemblance, the colony resemblance, the presence of magnetite and of PAH were explained without requiring life to be present. More biomarkers in the inner solar system. To the left, we have something made at CAP, is an antibody microrate uh, called solid signs of life detector and it has been used in the, in the Antarctica and many other places on earth and it could be used for example on Mars. To the right we have the famous for fine and the Venus life under mission study. I must say that if you read the paper in which there was the claiming of the detection of Orphine on Venus. The paper is correctly written. The big problem that there was two years ago was, was the content of the press release. That's a note for this thing of how to make public the discovery of biomarkers. In the previous ones were biomarkers in the inner solar system. Now in the outer solar system, we have, for example, in Europa, we have cryocraters and plumes on surface with a salty water ocean below and hypothetical hydrothermal vents at the bottom of that ocean. In Titan in the middle, which is a moon larger than Mercury and which has an atmosphere dense, denser than, than Earth's, by the way, the atmosphere discovered by Josep Comas y Solá and a Spanish astronomer, uh, in Titan, there are liquid hydro hydrocarbon lakes, but at 94 kelvins. And to the right, we have Enceladus with uh, its cryo volcanoes and geysers, also with a subsurface ocean, and even methane in the plumes, but it is even cooler uh, than Titan at 75 kelvins. So let's go to the topic which is biomarkers outside 
the solar system. This slide will appear afterwards, but here I just want you to see that there is blue the sky, the vegetation jump, which we call now the, re the red edge. We have oxygen, oxygen and ozone, we have water vapor, we have carbon dioxide, we have methane, and we have many other things. Biomarkers was half of the title of the seminar, the other half was exoplanet. And it is exoplanet and not extrasolar planet. I invite you to read in the internet about Virginia Trimble, a woman, an astronomer known for her annual reviews of astronomy and astrophysics research, studies of uh, telescope productivity with, uh, uh, with whom I talked some time ago and she told me, there are not intrasolar planets. So there must be no extrasolar planets either. So exoplanet biomarkers, exoplanets. Exoplanets have been a matter of philosophers, science fiction, uh, communicators as this one, Camille Flammarion, uh, the end of the 19th century, an influential book, La Pluralité de Mon Habité, the plurality of uh, uh, inhabited worlds. And exoplanet was that thing, science fiction until 1995 in which these two gentlemen, uh, to the left, Michel Mayor, to the right, Didier Queloz with uh, Instagram, they discovered the first exoplanet around a main sequence star, 1995. But everything was told already a few weeks ago in one of these uh, seminars, uh, academic seminars by our colleague, David Barrado. And you can find the, in the YouTube video uh, the history, methods, and background of discovery and characterization of uh, exoplanets. And I invite you to review this because let's say that my seminar is a second part for uh, David's uh, seminar. But we need to make a um, small summary of the detection of methods of, uh, of discovery of planets because we will need it for knowing what is the biomarkers. We have to look for stars. Some of them are not faint. These stars, we, for example, we investigated first with uh, spectrographs and we investigate the Doppler effect and we see radial velocity variations and we see the indirect gravitational pull of a, of a planet on the star. And some cases, some of these planets transit in front of the star and we see a decrease in the, in the light curve of it. And if we have both the transit light curve and the radial velocity curve, we can derive both the mass and the radius on the planet from which deriving the bulk density and infer something, models on the interior of the planet, the composition of the planet, and also the, the composition and the structure of the atmosphere. In this case, is um, something imaginary around GJ486, which was detected uh, 10 months ago, approximately, and, and we published it in, in science. Radio velocity measurements, as I told you before, is an effect of Doppler effect, an effect. <laughs> oh, okay, it's a Doppler effect. These were uh, um, imaginary images. These are the real data that Michel Mayor and Didier Queloz saw in 51 PEG. And they discovered something that it is a minimum mass of about half the size of Jupiter with a year, an orbital period of only 4.23 days. Um, a few months afterwards, um, Geoff Marcy and Paul Butler uh, confirmed the previous was previous diagram was face folded. This is non face folded. And if you collect a lot of data on 51 peg, 
the red velocities and and face folded again and you can derive the minimum mass the orbital period semi major axis the eccentricity of the orbit the semi the red velocity semi amplitude from the transit photometry this one was the first exoplanet that was discovered transiting in front of its star and then you can see for example at the beginning it is rather stable then it is the drop because of the planet passing in front of the disk of the star and then there is a lot of noise this is because we are observing from the ground and the star goes very low and we are observing at low air masses and it, it passes through a lot a thick layer of uh, earth atmosphere if we do the same but from space for example with the hubble space telescope we see a perfect curve even if hd 2094.58 b had a planet uh, sorry had the moon we could have seen it transits so with transits that was in the optical but if we go to the near infrared we can see something similar, uh, something different. In this plot by Heather Knudson, uh, in, with data in the infrared with the Spitzer Space Telescope, you see the primary transit, which is when the planet passes in front of the star at orbital phase zero. And then we have this, the secondary eclipse at orbital phase 0.5. In the bottom panel is a is just a zoom of the top one, but in a in the area around relative flux one. The difference between one and this wavy wavy line that we see is just the light from the planet. So we do see the planet only. It's it, we see the star and the planet, and we can take spectra at different moments when the planet passes in front of before the, the star. And depending on when we observe it, we can observe something in particular of the planet. For example, we can take a transmission spectrum of the atmosphere during transit. During the secondary eclipse, well, not during, but just before and just after the eclipse, we can measure the emission spectrum of the atmosphere, or even if the planet has not atmosphere, we can take an spectrum of the surface of the planet. And during the orbital phase variations, we can see the, um, the phases of the planet, like the, like the moon or Venus phases, because the planets uh, that are very close to their star are tidally locked. They all they they always show one hemisphere to the sun, the same as the moon to the earth. And then they have a, a, a heated illuminated hemisphere and another one, which is uh, cooler and presumably darker. An example of uh, transmission spectrum is this one. This is a discovery by Lisa Nordman, 2019, with the detection of uh, a line in the near infrared of helium one. It was already supposed that planets uh, do have uh, helium in their atmospheres, but uh, until 2019, there has been no measurement of helium in the atmospheres of the planet. So we can see the, the helium uh, and other elements in, in the atmospheres of planets. Some planets that was in, a, in absorption, some planets are so hot that we see the atmosphere in emission. And this is another example also obtained with Carmenes, which is the low to the top right. Some of you have identified it already. That was done with, uh, by Feijan et al, 2019. And here you can see calcium 2, the line of uh, HNK, and also the infrared uh, triple on a ultra hot Jupiter was 33B, which is as hot as the cooler stars. 
I mean, we are talking about effective temperatures of over 2000 kelvins. Uh, we must be very careful with this because we have to correct from the host star contribution, the rossiter McLaughlin effect, the center to limb variation, and put everything together and apply cross correlation function. This is the CCF that it is there, cross correlation function. Um, a quick summary. We have planets passing in front of their of their stars. It is written in Spanish, but uh, it is straightforward. The stars can be small or large. The planets can be small or large. The, the larger the planet, the easier to detect it. When we see this configuration, we see the star and the planet uh, simultaneously. Then we see all this spectrum. But when the planet passes behind the star, and we take a spectrum right now, then we see only the spectrum of the star. And it is naively simple that um, uh, when you subtract star plus planet minus star, eventually you get the spectrum of the uh, of the planet. I leave this video in a while while I take the cable. Sorry, I should have done it before. Um, something else for planets that uh, have transits and radio velocity measurements. We have the mass and we have the radius. And then we have the, the density. And I would say that this planet mass radius diagram, it is one of the most advanced ones done to date. In color, the symbols indicate the effective temperature of the host star. In red is the coolest, in blue is uh, the warmest. And in gray are planets with uncertainties larger than 30%. So you can, you you see a sequence of planets that go from the gaseous giants, uh, the icy giants, and the mini Neptunes and super Earths, and at the bottom to the left the exo Earths. Uh, solar system planets and are, are as a comparison, so it is straightforward to follow it. Now that I have battery, I can go on. This is a zoom of the previous plot. And then you can see that the gray line, green line is 100% silicate. The amber line is a mixture of iron and silicate, more or less the same uh, composition as uh, Venus and the Earth. And most of the rocky planets that we are discovering right now have a similar structure and composition as the Earth, but not all of them are, in, are habitable because biomarkers will be in the uh, planets in the habitable zone. And this is a planet a diagram by Hector Martinez Rodriguez et al, in which you can see semi major axis. Sun planet separation in the X level, star luminosity, brightness of the star in the Y axis. Field symbols are eclipsing planets. Um, open symbols are for radial velocity planets. Red ones to hot, light blue to cold, dark blue in the habitable zone. At the top right, you can see the eight planets of the solar system. Black dash line tidal locking boundary. Venus is in resonance 
two to three around the sun. So it is close to be tidally locked. And to the left, you have the, also the Roche limit for terrestrial planets. We are interested in the planets in the habitable zone, in the H set. How do we define a habitable zone, at least the astronomers, how do we do it? We, did, we base it in the uh, equilibrium radi radiative, and we measure an equilibrium temperature. We depend on the stellar volumetric luminosity, the planet semi-major axis, the separation between star and planet, and the bond albedo. The bond albedo is the fraction of light scattered from a body at all wavelengths and at all phase angles. And sigma at the bottom is Stefan Boltzmann constant. This is the equilibrium temperature, which is more or less the temperature at the top of the, of the layer of clouds. However, the equilibrium temperature is not the surface equilibrium. How can we estimate the surface equilibrium? Uh, there are several ways, and one of these is ones is assuming an effective optical thickness for an atmosphere. For example, on Earth, we have a small greenhouse effect that if not for that, the, surf, the, the mean surface temperature on Earth would be below zero. And, and the tau value of uh, Earth is 0 0.94. In comparison, the optic, effective optical thickness of Venus, when there is a huge greenhouse effect, is 160. And on Mars, which has a very thin and rarefied atmosphere, the tau is only 0 0.09. Now we have surface temperature and we define habitable by having surface liquid water. So that means that we need some um, remarkable pressure, surface pressure on the, on the surface. Surface liquid, Water is liquid at standard, at, 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 at Earth pressure between zero and 100 Celsius. However, uh, any planet that goes beyond 65 degrees goes into something called runaway greenhouse effect. This is what probably happened in Venus uh, millions giga years ago. So the actual habitable zone, it is between surf uh, surface temperatures between zero and 65 uh, Celsius approximately. Of course, one must do it carefully and make a 3D radiative transfer climate model and, and, and compute more uh, precisely this range of uh, surface temperatures. A uh, continuous habitable zone. Why continuous? Because we need time for life to for having been developed, um, for being created and evolved. Uh, following the Earth, we say that at least um, the star must be older than 0.6 uh, giga years which is the, the end of, uh, of the late heavy bombardment and the oldest signs of life on Earth. And the star, the star sorry, must be relatively nearby and relatively bright dwarfs because we need photons to collect uh, the data. And that makes that only late F, G, K, and M and also early L spectral type of stars can be investigated. Usually we should avoid very close binaries on stars that have very active uh, ma magnetical activity because measuring radio velocity and, and, and transits on those stars gets complicated. And then we have standard, standard habitable zone. And here, uh, as, a, as a zero step, as a first step, um, astronomers are quite geocentric. 
and, and do not think of exotic biochemistry and extremophilia because that would probably translate into extreme biomarkers. So we do not consider extremophiles, there are, that there are no thermophiles that can survive uh, beyond 100 degrees, uh, sorry, 100 Celsius. There are no barophiles that live below the surfaces, kilometers below, as probably uh, it happens on Earth, that there are no radioresistant extremophiles and can survive the extreme flares, which are very common, for example, in M dwarfs. Forget the silicon based boogies. And, and let's fix only to carbon-based metabolic reactions with the chemophoto autotrophs and heterotrophs as we have on, on Earth. And of course, for, forget about the techno, techno markers, which is uh, a task for SETI. How do we see the biomarkers in the atmospheres of planets? First, let's see how do we see them in our solar system, um, slowly. X axis wavelength, uh, it goes from five microns to 25 microns. So we are in the near infrared and the beginning of the mid infrared. In the Y axis, we have the flux at 10 parsecs. I mean, if we put Mars, Venus, and Mars at 10 parsecs surrounding a star, similar to our sun. And then we measure this flux, which is in photons per square meter, per hour, and per micro. In red, we have um, Mars. Uh, since it has a very thin and verified atmosphere, as I said before, uh, it follows more or less a black body uh, distribution, but with a huge absorption of CO2 centered around um, 15 microns. This absorption is even stronger and at wider wavelengths in the atmosphere in Venus. The composition of the, uh, the atmospheres of Venus of, of Mars is very similar, 98% CO2, but the pressure is very different. And in Venus, we only see CO2. And then on Earth, we see absorption by water, a uh, very peculiar and strong absorption at around nine microns of ozone, then also the CO2 and some water again in the mid infrared. And you can tell me if Venus is warmer in the surface uh, than Earth, why it is not above uh, the blue lines of the Earth if they are located at the same distance. Remember that uh, this uh, distribution depends not on the surface temperature, but on the equilibrium te temperature. And then since Venus has a very high bond albedo, the equilibrium temperature of Venus is lower than that, than Earth. This is in the near, in, in, the, in the infrared. How are the biomarkers in the solar system in the optical? In the optical, it's not so clear because we can see only a bit of ocean and oxygen too on Earth and a lot of water everywhere. And in Venus and Mars, CO2, 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 and the iron oxides. And biomarkers outside the solar system, well, Let's concentrate for the moment with current technology on uh, planets that transit their stars. We can observe them either from ground telescopes or from uh, the space. And we can observe, we must observe, and observe them during and after, or just before and just after uh, and during the transits. And we can detect, for example, this is the example, uh, uh, water, carbon dioxide, and methane. And I promised you before that we would see this slide again, and let's look at it more carefully. 
we have the blue of the sky which is the uh, Rayleigh scattering, which gives the um, blue color to our sky, the, the ones that goes proportional to the to lambda at power four. Um, remember that the dust uh, does not follow Rayleigh scattering, uh, goes with another power law. And then um, there it is written, measure the total amount of atmosphere if you have dust, it will be not so blue. That's things of, of haze. But uh, to sum up, the bluer, the bigger you have an atmosphere. Then purely life um, features are those of oxygen and ozone if they are produced by photosynthetic um, organisms and the red jump, the vegetation jump, which is the green part that it is absorbed by the algae on the oceans or the forest in Amazonas. Then we need liquid water and liquid water is in equilibrium with atmosphere. And then we will see these uh, fluffy clouds pretty on the sky, water vapor, Besides, we should have also, also carbon dioxide because we need volcanic activity in a living planet. Why? Because we need plate tectonics. And why do we need plate tectonics? Because we need a carbon cycle that recycles the, the, the carbon that it is uh, fixed by the photosynthetic systems into rocks and and not in the atmosphere, which is what happens in Mars and Venus. I told you before, 98% of the atmosphere is CO2. All the carbon that was originally in the atmosphere of proto-Earth is now fixed to the, to the crust because of this uh, carbon cycle and the plate tectonics. And finally, there can be another um, biomarker such that methane, which presents of anaerobic bacteria. This is something simple, does not go to the detail. When you want to, the, when you go to the detail, then uh, there is a lot of uh, literature and bibliography on this matter. And you can start with the book by James Casting, uh, the, the investigator who defined for the first time the habitable zone. And he wrote this, how to find a habitable planet. And he's given the answer, the holy grail. There is a whole chapter on it. It is discovery of, or detection of simultaneously of oxygen and reduced gases, which is a way to say, finding thermodynamical disequilibrium or non thermodynamical equilibrium. But we must be very careful. And I will follow Nick Cowan's word. Um, he first say uh, atmospheric biomarkers, in this case, gases are expected to be found on a living planet and not on a dead planet. But, and this is the important thing, we must understand how these gases can be produced abiotically. This is a false positive. And on the other side, we have to understand how these gases might be hidden, which are false negatives. Now with this thing of COVID, uh, we should know already what is a false positive and a false po negative, but I will put a, um, a couple of examples. False positive. For example, you may remember this ozone absorption at 99.6 microns on Earth, which one may think this is a wonderful biomarker. But for example, you can also find ozone in the atmospheres of Europa and Ganymede because of photolysis. On Venus, during the runaway greenhouse, it should have a huge ocean absorption. Then if you go to other planets, um, to exoplanets, the depth 
of the ocean uh, line will depend on planet clouds cover and also on the host spectra, star spectral type. More or less hap uh, happens uh, the same with uh, methane because there are many abiogenic ways of producing it. And you can think of the many times that uh, somebody has claimed that has discovered methane on Mars. And the audio is close. I suppose that many of you are at least smiling. Example of false negatives. Here I saw the example of Lisa Kaltenegger and my college. And, and their biomarkers and their evolution over time. By the way, Lisa uh, says that her favorite combination of biomarkers is methane and, and nitrogen, uh, oxygen of nitrogen uh, together. Well, this is at different Earth times, how um, the biomarkers would appear. And you see water vapor, CO2, methane, oxygen 2, and ozone. But this is because um, the, the partial pressure of oxygen in the atmosphere of Earth, and as well as of methane, has changed a lot through history. For example, there was the great oxidation of event that happened at around 2.0, 2.4 giga years, which is where is the peak of occurrence of banded iron formations. Before that, there was life, not, not complex, but there was, uh, whoever, there was no ocean to be detected. Actually, until the start of Cambrian at uh, 0.54 mega years, um, at, the, at the very top, um, the, the partial pressure of O2 was several orders of magnitude lower. So the, we, we can say that on Earth, um, only during a small fraction of its time, we could have detected uh, ocean. So this is a false uh, negative. As I told you before, there is a lot of publications of biomarkers and biosignatures and, and in, the, um, in, in the literature. And I told you that it, this would be a hitchhiker guide to biomarkers. So how to start? Just go to this uh, review by Schwitterman. Uh, published in Astrobiology in 2018, Exoplanet Biosignatures, a review of remotely detectable signs of life. And it is a very, very comprehensive um, review with a lot of references. And you can start by reading this, and then you can expand your thoughts on it. They followed, for example, they enumerate all possible gaseous uh, biosignatures. Oxygen, ozone, methane, nitro, nitro oxide, sulfur gases, um, ethane, methyl chloride, hyses as well. And there are also sur surface biosignatures with the, the vegetation jump, the red edge, and an interesting uh, subsection 514 speculation about photosynthesis and pigment signatures on exoplanets. That I, I wanted to link to a new project that we started at the Center of Astrobiology, Center of Astrobiologia, which, is, which we call Exophot, Exoplanet Photosynthesis, in which we are measuring from a new perspective the fitness of a lot of different photopigments, uh, photosynthetic pigments depending on the spectral type of the stars, the type of atmospheres, and many more factors. Well, you want to detect these biomarkers. How can you detect them? One usually thinks, OK, we have now the James Webb. Let's wait for James Webb. I would say that 
we will do something earlier with ELD and their new um, instrumentation. First um, light of ELT will be relatively soon, 2027. And actually, if you go to Google Maps and look for the site, and you see that you already have half a mountain excavated and you have the basement for the, for the ELT, and in many factories around the world, components of the telescope are being um, built and assembled right now, and everything will be moved in a matter of months and years to Chile, from where we can detect biomarkers. The good thing of the ELT, since it is very big, I remind 39 meters in diameter, and I also remind the biggest one right now, it is the Gran Telescopio Canarias, 10.4 meter diameter. So it is four times larger in diameter, about 16 times larger in aperture area. With this and um, good coronagraph, we can take spectra directly of planets that are not transiting the star. This is an example with uh, of H. HR8799, um, a young star with four jo Jovian planets observed with uh, eight and, and, and 10 meter class telescopes. But let's go to space where the window of the near infrared and the mid infrared opens uh, to us. We had in the past Kepler that was for transiting planets, the same as TESS right now, but at closer distances. With Gaia, the third pair, uh, we will um, find planets with the astrometry method. James Webb, I will tell you something just afterwards. Keops is improving um, light curves of transiting, of known transiting planets. Plato will find thousands of um, exo-Earth candidates that will need radio velocity follow-up. Ariel will take better spectra and spectra in the, in the mid infrared for the first time for a lot of known transiting planets. And the Roman, previously W first telescope, uh, has a um, or will have a coronagraph with which we'll be able to image some planets as well. But we are, we are all waiting for James Webb. And this is, where is Webb one hour ago? Um, it is about to start aligning the mirror segments. Everything has been deployed. Everything has been a success. The launch, the, the, the deployment of the secondary mirror of the primary mirror. So after the alignment of the mirror segments, there will be just a last burn of the, of the engines for insertion in Lagrange to orbit. And just afterwards, they will start collecting images and, and spectra of objects in the cosmos in um, particular of transiting planets. But James Webb, I think, will be small. This is a very recent paper by Capriche Phillips, uh, accepted already in Astrophysical Journal, in which they present um, an analysis and conclude that we need 10 transits, I repeat, 10 transits with three different instrumental configurations of the James Webb Space Telescope only for detecting ammonia in an icy giant. Okay, ammonia is not a biomarker. Icy giant is much bigger than an exo-Earth, so it will be much more complicated 
much more complicated to, de to detect biomarkers on exoerts with James Webb. We will need to observe many different transits with many different instrumental configurations. For that, we are thinking already for the next generation, the gen next generation observatory. For example, NASA published the US Decadal Survey a couple of months ago, and they concluded that um, we need a six meter telescope, which is more or less uh, a mixture of the past uh, Louvre and Habex uh, projects, which would observe in the ultraviolet, in the optical, and the near infrared. Not in the near, in the mid infrared and near infrared, as the James Webb uh, Space Telescope is doing. Honestly, I think that six meter is small, so maybe we can think of other alternatives. And for years, there was some ESA project called Darwin, and in NASA, it was terrestrial planet finder inter interferograph interferometer uh, on new worlds, which may fly at around 2050, that, that ESA is taking shape and, and we call it now the large interferometer for exoplanets. The website is life slash space slash mission.com, which may, have, may be launched in 2050s or earlier or just afterwards. And with that, we can do something like this. Uh, Oscar is the fourth author and he's listening to, to me, so he can say a lot on, on this, but this is what we need. I mean, is taking a spectra and measure simultaneously ozone, nitrogen, methane, CO2 on a planet like our Earth around a solar-like star. And just to finish, uh, life wants you, and by you, uh, it does not only mean astronomers, but only, but also biologists, chemists, geologists, physicists, engineers, engineers, electronics, computers, optics, mechanics. And just for the very last slide, uh, commercial, if you have liked the videos that have been shown, uh, maybe look at the program of your closest uh, planetarium because maybe beyond the sand is under and I have been behind that. Thank you very much.